Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. They offer free checking with industry-leading mobile banking. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. What's going on, Hokie Nation? Coming to you hot on a Monday morning after one of the biggest weekends in Virginia Tech women's basketball history. Not to mention, baseball is rolling, softball had a great weekend, and Athens lacrosse won, men's basketball took a trip up to Pittsburgh as well. We're talking all that and more. It's episode 350 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, and it starts right now. Welcome in once again, Hokies fans. We record on this awesome Monday morning, February 26, 2024. Weather is great. We're at the studio at the Virginia Tech Corporate Research Center. Hey, remember to like, subscribe, and show the show to a friend as well. Head over to the techsideline.com boards and the uh, website as well. Check out our extensive editorial content. As always, the first month of subscriptions is free. I'm your host, Giovanni Heater. Across the way, our managing editor, David Cunningham. To my right, senior staff writer, Andy Bitter in the middle chair today. Always be red shirt. (laughs) And then in the fourth chair, it's our lead analyst and columnist, Chris Coleman. So a little bit of rotation on the set today, fellas. Weather is great. We said, hey, we got to come at everybody with a podcast on Monday uh, because of the big day for Virginia Tech women's hoops yesterday inside Castle. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I didn't. Know Great you, start, guys. I mean, Great I didn't start. know if you were gonna tee anything up more than that. Um, yeah, no big day. I mean, uh, you were calling baseball, right? So you did not actually get a chance to experience it. Yeah, I, I, I was gonna say it's one of those things where uh, Raza, who is our baseball writer, so go check out some of his great stuff. He's doing a great job. Um, him and I were both saying, man. Obviously, incredibly thankful for the opportunity to be there. It's an honor for him to write and for me to fill in for Evan um, with Learfield. But we were like, this is one of those where we're literally like 500 yards away down Beamer Way. And it's like, this is going to be one of those like 15 years from now. We're going to be like, man, you know, I wish I was there. How many Um, people were at the baseball game? It was not as bad of a crowd as I thought it would be. Uh, there were probably, I'd have to look at the exact attendance, but you know, sold tickets don't necessarily actually. I would say probably around 200 people which was more than I thought. I thought it would be dead considering what was going on in Castle, mm-hmm. but I heard it was a tough ticket to get in Castle. Yeah, so. Well, not for game day. Game day was everybody can get in, and right. that show was awesome. Yeah, uh, I know Will Stewart was there as well. I was there covering it, and Virginia Tech put on a show. Nick was also there on the floor. Uh, I believe Carter Hill was down there on the floor as well. Ivan and John, our two photographers, were down there. <laughs> terrific atmosphere terrific environment I, I think what made virginia tech stand out so much to the espn talent was that so many times when they have done this show since it kind of started as a women's own women's basketball only thing in 2022 most of the time the shows are an hour before the game for example earlier this year at lsu it was an 8 p.m game and it was on at seven So they are on the court while players are warming up. And, like, yeah, it's cool to show the atmosphere, but you don't really get a sense of it because everybody's in their seats. And sometimes they they do it, sometimes they don't put the audio through the arena. Yesterday, you're the only show in town. For that hour, you're there. Um, Shanae Agumake had a live hit on SportsCenter at 945. Or, or 10.45, excuse me. Uh, no, 9.45 is right. Uh, and she was, uh, it's with like the get up with game day crew. Uh, and, and she was just talking about Virginia Tech and, and some of the other teams around the country. Uh, and she was at the desk. And it was funny, like like watching her, she was like having trouble he- not hearing because she's got, you know, she's mic'd up. But like having trouble like keeping her composure because of how loud the crowd was. I think, and I was talking to a couple other people about this, I think back to 1999 when College Game Day came here for football for the Virginia Tech-Syracuse game. And that was the first time Game Day had been here. And Game Day had been doing stuff for a little bit, but had never really witnessed huge crowds before. And Virginia Tech put on a show. And I think that's why Game Day became such a staple Virginia Tech became such a staple for game day. It kind of set the bar really, really high. And L. Duncan, 
uh, said said as much yesterday at, at the end. And uh, George Amorn and, and Liz Kitley were on. I thought they did a really, really good job. Kenny Brooks was on. I thought it was really cool. He wore one of the uh, the Love Autism yep. sweatshirts for uh, for Raven Kitley, which I think says a lot. Um, you know, college game is in, in-house on national television and your coach is, is supporting that cause. I think that, that, that says a lot about who he is. Um, but the crowd was phenomenal. I, I was really impressed. It was... Basically, for the three middle sections on that side, almost up to the top. Like, I, I I would have to go back and look, but I think it was a bigger crowd than when game day came here in 2011 Wow, for men's basketball. So that was great. And then Tech had a basketball game to go play on senior day, and Tech won and won it and beat North Carolina. And as of this morning, or as of this afternoon, about 12.45 on Monday, Hokies are up to number five in the AP Top 25, and lots of national publicity this morning. Yeah, we're going to unpack it all. Andy, you were traveling from Pittsburgh back on down. Did you get a chance to see any of the magic on TV or listen on listen in somehow? Or uh, No. No. <laughs> uh, and, you know, college game day is fine. It, it's a sideshow, whatever. I thought was what was more impressive was, you know, they had that, all that energy beforehand. They had senior day, so it's a little emotional beforehand, you know, saying goodbye possibly to, to four different players. I know Amor has a chance to come back. There were one more year chance within the, the crowd uh, when they were announcing her name. But then they go out there, and they just absolutely snuffed out UNC in the first quarter. I mean, it's 21-5 to five after the first quarter. What was it, an 18-2 run yeah. or something like that? And, I mean, they put the game away immediately, and that, you know, uh, that could be a tough moment for a team to regroup you know, all the emotions, highs and lows beforehand. They go out there and they just, you know, took care of business right away. It's an impressive, mature team that, uh, I mean, 10 straight wins at this point. Uh, it's not out of the realm of the possibility they could run the table going into the NCAA tournament. I thought that would have been impossible when we looked at it a couple of weeks ago. It's entirely possible now. And uh, you look at where they are in the, the bracket projections, maybe on the two seed Outside chance of a one seed if they keep winning like this. I mean, this team is peaking at the right time. It's just a, it's an impressive program to watch right now. Before we dive super deep into it, got to remind everyone, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. As our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring you all the great content across all of our platforms. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Bank with First Bank and Trust Company. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. Chris, want to turn it over to you a little bit here. Uh, what impressed you most about Virginia Tech women's hoops yesterday and Hokie Nation as well turning out? I think Andy just hit on it when you're up 21 to 5. Um, that's pretty good for a team that's not known for its defense, right, David? Um, <laughs> you know, the UNC coach pointed out if you take away that first quarter, uh-huh. they're right in that game. Right. Sure, sure. That's you right. It like and four if you take away, and if you take away Georgia Amor's foul trouble, Tech <laughs> wins by 25. Yeah. You, you know, it is what it is. If you take away a fourth quarter in 99, Tech's got a national championship. <laughs> oh, like, right. You could say that for every game <laughs> yeah. ever. <laughs> she made that point several times in the post. An she oddly did. combative post game. It was very weird. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't seem to like. She doesn't seem to take losing gracefully. But I tell you what, so right. Kenny Brooks is 10-2 and two against Courtney Banghart in, 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 in their rivalry. It's pretty one-sided. Yeah, it is. Um, but, you know, I guess the, the, the other thing that stands out to me, again, like Andy said, a few weeks ago we were on the podcast talking about can they do what they did last year and win at a high level, win all their games down the stretch. And I think I said, like, how they play down the stretch will determine whether they're a three-seed or a six-seed. Well, now we're talking – or they're going to be a one seed or a two seed, so that's how dominant they've they've been down the stretch. Uh, very impressive to see um, that they've already locked up the number one bid in the ACC tournament. If they went out, like they'll probably be a one seed. It would be hard. For, I mean, cause some of that's dependent on what other teams do as well. Um, but but I, I would have to think that a team that won out. For, what are the what are the what are they now? They will have won fifteen straight games. Yeah. yeah. If it, if it Tech wins out through the ACC tournament. And they'd have four losses. Um, basically be the same team as last year um, from a result standpoint. Um, it would be exactly the same. Four losses. Yeah. yeah. yeah that yeah. would be that would be the exact. What was the win streak last year after losing at Duke, winning through? Uh, I think it was 10 up through the ACC tournament. So wow. Tech would have uh, five, five, wow. five game longer win streak. Yeah, and lost, lost earlier in the year. Um and I, I want to remind people that, like, don't 
don't get caught up in the bracketology. Like it, it, I think, I think tech should be tech fans should be appreciative of all the national attention it's getting right now. Obviously college game day, but like between the athletic and ESPN's power rankings this morning, tech is three and one and four in the other. And tech was a focal point in both of those. Um, but bracketology does not mean anything right now. Like, yes, it's fun to look at, but there's still potentially five games left for Virginia Tech to play and make its case. And it was not until Tech won that ACC tournament last year, we were walking into the post game to talk to Kenny Brooks, and Charlie Cream tweets out that Tech's going to be a one seed. Like, Tech was right there, right there, right there, and hadn't quite shown enough. I put that in quotes because... Um, you know, Tech might have, but if Tech loses, I don't know if Tech gets a one seed. But anything is possible, and I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't count it out. You know, some somebody said yesterday on the boards, I saw that that Charlie Cream said even if Tech wins out and wins the AC tournament, Tech might get a one seed. I don't I, like. It's possible. Don't don't rule it out. But but like Chris said, they're on a roll right now, and I think I wrote about it yesterday. Andy had a really good comment about Elizabeth Kitley and and her dominance, but. Um, but I kind of focused on that business like aspect. I was at Louisville last weekend and saw them walk into that arena with 13,000 people and not really bat an eye. And they kind of similar to this North Carolina game, they, <clears throat> they took the opponent out of the game early. That's hard to do. They have a chance to go on the road to Notre Dame on Thursday and win five, their fifth strength ranked road win in a row that's in, insane and that's how good they are right now and i i think the fact that you know george amor uh she actually replied to my tweet this morning because i i tweeted uh i'm disappointed i did not respond i, I did not follow up in the press conference and ask she made a basketball is life reference and i was like i wonder if that was a ted lasso denny rojas reference and she said yes i can't confirm it was um but she said we just have our minds right. Like the game is the game. That's what we have our mind on. Like we, we don't let any outside distractions get to them. They could have let college game day, senior day, all that get to them. And they come out in the end of the first quarter, they're up 21, five and Carolina cut back into it when Amor went out with foul trouble in the second quarter, but tech rolled away in the, in the second half. And that's a sign of a good team being able to kind of block out the noise and, and have a performance like that. Going through some of the numbers here, you mentioned it. Tech outscores Carolina 21-5. to No Amor in the second quarter. Carolina actually outscores Tech 22-12. to That got them back into the game. You had that three ball by Kelly uh, to head into the halftime break. Thought maybe that could give Carolina a little bit of momentum, but it uh, wasn't the case. 24-20. to Tech outscores them in the third, 17-15 to uh, in the fourth quarter. A ho-hum, as Kenny Brooks likes to say, uh, 34 points uh, for Liz Kitley. She did it on top of it. Six rebounds. 12 of 14 from the free throw line. Amor was a point shy at 20. Uh, she had 19 points, 11 assists in her double double. Matilda Ack knocked down some threes, three of six from beyond the arc. She had 11 points. That's all your Hokies in double figures. Just overall team effort. David, out of all of it, when you look at, at some of the numbers here, is there anything that, like, is this like the cemented? You're seeing the same players? Because remember, this was the point last year where Kenny Brooks started to kind of fizzle away at who was playing, and you really keyed in on, like, you had six to seven people on the court. Is, is that where we're at again this year? I think in some ways, yeah. Um, I was surprised we didn't see Karis Baker a little bit more, but I think Kenny Brooks is rolling with what works. If, it's bro if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? What he's getting from these players, like, I, I think Carly Wenzel is a terrific example. She's playing great basketball lately. Uh, she had... I want to say the Duke game and the Syracuse game were back-to-back, -back, and I, I think she had like nine combined turnovers in those two games. And she's maybe had, in the last ten, nine or ten games, she's had maybe like three or four total. Like, she's, she's playing more composed. She's not turning the ball over. She's playing really good defense. He, he's found players he can't take off the floor, and that's what's the difference. He's, he's like, I, I think he has found that rotation. Um... I think Samuel's been great. He he compared her performance to Dennis Rodman. Yes, she had, she had two points and, and fourteen rebounds, and she did foul out. But to to do that on Senior Day, like she's such a big reason why Virginia Tech is winning this rebounding battle night in and night out. 
Uh, then you you bring on bring in a player like Clara Strack who can give you big minutes at the four. Um, Elizabeth Kitley did not come out, but she can play at the five if needed in, in Kitley's stead. And she comes in and has a bucket, has like four rebounds. Like you're getting consistent contributions from these kids. And if you are and you don't need any more and you're winning, why change it? I said a couple weeks ago that she was playing like Rodman, and you guys said, well, I hope she takes that the right way as a compliment. But now that Kenny Brooks said it too, I don't feel bad about it uh, anymore. It is very Rodman-esque, and there's that meme out there where he's in the last dance where all the rebounds coming <laughs> off different ways. That That's Olivia Samuel uh, to a T. And then you go ahead and talk about Amor. She passed Lisa Witherspoon as the all-time assist leader in Virginia Tech women's basketball program history. That was awesome. Let's talk a little bit more big picture stuff with this team. You guys had kind of heated up North Carolina State and Syracuse they're gonna play on Thursday night down in Reynolds Coliseum that's a fight for second place in the ACC Syracuse has already booked the double bye uh, and clinched that tough one down in Reynolds for both the Orange and the Wolfpack two really really good teams David is there a preference here if you're a tech fan how you want to see that shake up is there somebody that you don't want to have to play until the very end of it well in th- there's a lot to shake out still. Um, there's a log jam, kind of on like on the men's side. There's a log jam, uh, four way tie for third place right now. It's Tech, Syracuse, and then I want to say NC State, Louisville, Notre Dame, and Florida State. And there, it, 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 the, the thing is, Tech will play like the team on Tech side of the bracket is the four seed. Um, so Syracuse is likely going to grab the, the number two and won't, and won't, uh, probably tech, uh, Syracuse and NC State probably won't impact tech. Um, but if you're tech, tech has Notre Dame, same time, seven o'clock Eastern on ESPN, Syracuse, NC State's at seven Eastern on AC network extra geo. But mm-hmm. if, if you're tech, I think you want NC State to win because that keeps the Wolfpack on the other side of the bracket. I think that is the most dangerous team in the ACC not named Virginia Tech. Um, But also, it hands Syracuse a loss, which means even if Tech does not win on Thursday night in South Bend, the Hokies would clinch the ACC title outright. They obviously clinched a share of the ACC regular season title yesterday. Uh, They clinched the number one seed in Greensboro. A Syracuse loss, no matter, I mean, even if Tech loses, would, would, seal it. Uh, Syracuse is the only team that can catch Tech at this point. All right, coming up on Thursday, number 17, Notre Dame. This this is an interesting matchup here, David, because you were breaking down for us before the show. They're actually the highest ranked team in the net in the ACC, despite being 17th in the country, according to the AP poll. They metrically shape up better than anybody else in the conference. So this is a really big opportunity for Tech to kind of jump ahead in that category when it comes to the whole bracketology conversation. Yeah, uh, big big metric opportunity. NC, uh, Notre Dame is 10, and that's what happens when you go to UConn and, and blow the doors off. Notre Dame only has losses to good teams, South Carolina, Syracuse twice, NC State, Louisville, North Carolina, this is going to be a big test for Virginia Tech. But Tech has not flinched at big tests before. Like I said, this is an opportunity to win for Tech to win its fifth consecutive ranked game on the road. Like, that's it's not- easier said than done. And I think Andy Andy, and, and Chris both said it earlier. A couple weeks ago, we were sitting here going, that's a really tough stretch for Tech. For Tech to get out of it, unscathed might be nearly impossible. And now we're sitting on the other side and, and Tech's almost through it. Um, I think I think this is a good opportunity for Tech, though, to continue to bolster the resume because I think people pay attention to Notre Dame. It's a big name. Everybody knows who Notre Dame is. Um, it, it's, a, it's a team that uh, obviously is run by freshman point guard Hannah Hildago. She's outstanding. Um, she will win ACC Freshman of the Year. Uh, and she's probably the one player in the conference that could challenge, could, but I expect Elizabeth Kitley to win her third straight AC player of the year. Um, but Hill Dog goes right there. Um, she's been terrific as a freshman. They're run by her. Guard play is going to be important. I'm sure they'll put Kayla King on Hill Doggo. And, and she was really good, I thought, on Deja Kelly yesterday. She's staying out of foul trouble. That's the key with, with Kayla King. Even when her shot's not necessarily falling, she got Tech going a little bit with that deep three-pointer yesterday. But if she can continue to 
to stay out of foul trouble and and play good defense like she's been doing all year, staying out of foul trouble is the key part um, because then Tech has to kind of shift stuff around. But uh, it's going to be quite the matchup. I'm really excited. I will be there in attendance. Um, Purcell Pavilion. Yeah, fun, I, I've fun been arena. there. I've been there one time. I went there in 2019 when uh, when Tech played Notre Dame in football there. You pick up your creden- you picked up your football credentials, or I did at least in in like the lower bowels of oh, Purcell. Okay. Purcell. So I'm excited to go and see it. And and Notre Dame's a really good team. Another NCAA tournament team. Tech has a chance to be. That matters. Come Selection Sunday. Do you need any bar recommendations for South Bend? Sure. Okay, I'll hook you up after the podcast. <laughs> All, right. All right, sounds good. Uh, looking forward to hearing that conversation off the air. Andy, what's key for this team to make a deep run in March? You know. It, yeah, you know, we t- we talk about the role players and all that stuff, and that's key to have those people making big contributions. But I think really what drives this team is is obviously Amor and Kitley, and if they're on their game and if they're playing uh, to the peak of their abilities, this is a tough team to beat. And you saw how important Amor was when she had to go to the bench in that second quarter with foul trouble, and the offense just didn't move the same. The ball's not moving as quickly. Uh, you don't sort of have that. Spitfire guard. That's t- I mean, she's a one one woman press break when she's out there. She can just dribble out of it, and there's not really much the other team can do. Uh, I described her in my story as the the straw that stirs the drink of this team. She yeah. sort of brings that element to this group. And uh, you know, I thought all season, I think you know, this team how far it gets in the tournament will be based on you know how much Amor steps up her game because. She sort of has that uh, alpha mentality, and then you you know you go in there and you watch this game that Kitley played the other night, and man, she seems like a, a different player. And I asked Kenny Brooks about that uh, after the game, like what is different about her this year? And he gave this great anecdote. He's like, well, her given name is Elizabeth, uh, and when she gets angry on the court, she turns into Elizabeth. But and he stopped. He didn't say the whole <laughs> words. But this is Kenny Brooks who said this. Now I am not saying this nickname. Uh, but and then Georgia Amor chimed in. She's like, "That's what her contact name is in my phone." So when she calls, that's the name that shows up on it. But like, you think about the past. I, th- I think the knock on her that maybe a little soft when when teams would would really body her and play her physically. And I think the the peak moment of this last year was LSU in the Final Four, where LSU just. Like bludgeoned her down low. I mean, it was it was like a wrestling match down there, and there's some you know pictures that uh, we got where she's like on the the ground, just kind of looking incredulously at the refs, like, "Come on, like what is going on? I'm getting beat the hell up down here." I think before that really bothered her and took her out of her game. And you know, Kenny talked about it. They have worked on trying to you know get her to to kind of channel that anger and take it out on opponents. And I think you're seeing more of that now. I mean, she's through threw a couple bows out there, elbows uh, <laughs> out wide and uh, getting aggressive a couple times against UNC. So I, I think when she gets into that and you saw the, the uh, you know, the, the result yesterday, 34 points, and it was almost like a, I don't want to say effortless 34 points because it sounds like she wasn't working hard, but she made it look so easy out there, whether it was, uh, you know, the fadeaway jumpers, the pick and roll that she and Amor have uh, down pat, the free throw, she was 12 of 14 from the free throw line. I mean, she's just a very... Uh, strong offensive player and defensive too, but I mean, when she gets angry and gets out there, kind of puts that into her game. It, it's something else. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought that was an interesting uh, anecdote that uh, <laughs> put it in perspective that Kenny Brooks had. I was trying to think of an alternate title for my uh, my uh, story, and I was thinking of "Don't Mess with the Bee" in Uniform Thirty Three. Does anybody remember that? That sitcom show, don't don't mess, don't trust the bee in apartment twenty three. You had to show me Kristen Ritter. No Kristen Ritter fans I, I, on the I set. I know what Come you're on. talking about. Okay, vaguely. but uh, I think people would have not gotten the the reference unless they read the story. So I'm like, I don't want to deal with that headache. Uh, but this was Kenny Brooks, by the way, that brought up this nickname, not me. So if, uh, you know, take it up with him if you grew up upset about this. Can we get a TSL nil deal going though? And oh, get some t-shirts made with that. I'm sure really that, that should be out there. Yeah. That'd be a great thing. Yeah. Um, like Andy All said, right, if it's a good idea, I want two percent. No. <laughs> oh, you man, you're a low baller. <laughs> but uh, how the Pistons defended Jordan in the '80s? They just beat the tar out of him. I was just gonna and, say that. But yeah. once he learned to adjust, took him a year or so, and then you know the Bulls were the best team after that. So uh, it's kind of I'm not saying you know Tech's gonna go win the national title or anything like the, you know the Bulls were winning NBA titles, but it's a similar thing. You're right. I mean, they just bludgeoned her to death is the best way to put it last year. And it actually amazes me that 
some things some teams have been allowed to do to her have actually been allowed to happen. Um, That's always the case but, with centers. Yeah. I mean, historically, you look, look at the NBA and like Shaq and Wilt and all those centers. It's like nobody has any sympathy for the, right. the center, the big right. people out there. Right. So they almost let smaller players just but, go you, to you, town and just beat the heck out right. of them. right. And uh, I think one thing she's done, she's always been a really good mid-range player, but now she's like elite. Like I was one of the unfortunates that did not get a ticket for the game yesterday, so I had to watch it on television. And one of the announcers said that she thinks Liz Kitley is the best mid-range shooter in the history of women's college basketball. I don't pretend to be an expert in the history of, of women's college basketball, but I would not be surprised if that was true because she's absolutely elite at that mid-range jumper. And it's hard to beat up somebody when they're shooting the ball from 13 feet away, right? So that's another way to combat it. She's gotten tougher, but she's also improved other elements of her of her game also. She's just a complete player. I, I find interesting, first of all, we're two for two on last dance references today, <laughs> which, which has been funny. Um, we actually, this is like a, a, a tiny side tangent that I think David and, and Nick would appreciate. We had a, a, a prospective professor come in for SMA because they're really trying to get into the analytics part of our major. It's sports media and analytics and and we don't really do the whole analytics part as much as, as some people would like. And so he came in and taught a, a lesson uh, on like statistics and everything and like kind of broke down stuff. And they were this, like, basically it was an audition for him. Uh, and I sat in on that and he was talking about how gone are the days of the mid range jumper in basketball. And he's talking about the statistics of y- your highest probably like it's worth more to shoot the three, even though it's a lower percentage shot. And he's breaking that down as well as points in the paint. And, Someone just kind of raised their hand. I think it was Robin Reed, and he was just kind of like, "Well, what about Liz Kitley? Like, she's kind of the 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 um, outlier outlier in that situation." And thank you, Chris. And so I I kind of found that interesting because she really is playing different than anybody else. People uh, say it's a point. lost art, and and it's correct that when you're playing the percentages, like. If you're going to take a 17 foot jumper, you might as well step back two feet, right? And right. that was the argument, right, yeah. right? Right. But at the same time, you know, she's taken 14, 13 foot jumpers, and uh, and she's so much taller than everybody else that it's not like you can really get a hand in her face. Um, and if you practice that a lot with her height, you can get really good at it. And it's just something that teams, it's very difficult to stop. Yeah, you know, it's funny. So I, I obviously wrote a story on Elizabeth Kitley and Kayla King last week. And uh, for the story, I talked with both sets of parents, but I also talked with Kenny Brooks. And uh, in that day, that morning, the morning of uh, when I talked with him, um, they were prepping for Carolina and they ran, he said they ran Liz through a game situation, which is essentially she shoots like 25 to 26 shots. She runs down the floor, gets set up, essentially runs in action, gets set up to a shot that she would take in a game. And he was like, yeah, she went like 23 to 25. Wow. Um, But it's funny when you listen to to him and and her parents talk about her. She's a perfectionist. and, And what she has done is in some ways just adjusted her game to the point where it's so hard for people to guard because you can't it you can't play her one on one some teams have but then she goes off for 34 um i think back to that duke game where you can try to double her but she made the play of the game her lone assist of the game was a dish out to amor for an open 3 i thought one of the most the maybe the mo- It's a part that maybe people don't appreciate enough. But what she did yesterday was, Tech, I thought Tech moved the ball really well when Amor was on the floor. The ball goes in, and she has two or three people trying to swipe at it. And she's, like, holding it up here, and she passes out of it. And then, you know, then they, they reset and pass it down low to her. Like, there were times last year when she was getting bludgeoned, and she would lose the ball down low. She hasn't turned the ball over as much in those scenarios this year. So she's perfected that. She's also perfected her turnaround. And when you combine those things, so she's turning it over less and she's, you know, still making those shots even probably at a higher rate. Like she's just become this weapon. And and I, I thought Andy's piece r- really summed it up. You, you know, she's, she's still this super, super nice person well raised and um but she she's 
yes, people might look at her as like a finesse player because she's constantly fading away, but that's what she's really good at. But if you piss her off, what'd you say? She's going to go like Incredible Hulk on you? Is that yeah, it's like Bruce Banner, mild-mannered Bruce Banner, yeah. get an Incredible Hulk and then <laughs> comes out and she plays angry and it's been effective. She's yeah. been effective doing that this year. She's had more of a, a moxie this year. They touched on that on game day. Um, they were asking like what their favorite celebrations are and George is like, Liz doesn't really have a celebration. She just like gives that face. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and that's what she's been doing this year, which you didn't see last year. So it's almost like a different level of confidence. Do, do, you, guys, do you guys remember Eric Green who played Tech? And as a yeah. senior, as a senior, he led Virginia Tech in scoring. Or as nobody he led, led the, the country, country in, scoring. in scoring. Okay, so I, I was interviewing Will John Johnson one time, who was a uh, another basketball player on the team, I was doing a feature on him, and we were talking about Eric Green, and Will, and I was like, man, he makes some crazy shots from some crazy places, and Will said, yeah, and he practices every one of them. He was like, I have not seen him make a shot in a game that I don't see him practice every single wow. day. He had that type of work ethic where he was going to take every practice, every shot from every possible angle, and that's the type of work ethic he had, and I think that's that's. Similar to what what Kitley's done, she's she's really mastered. She's kind of a complete offensive player. Well, she is a complete offensive player. And what? another thing is, she's looking for a shot more. Um, you know, Kenny said that you know he went to her last year and it's like, you know, you need to be comfortable taking twenty shots a game, and that's just just wasn't in her nature necessarily. And she did it a couple times last year. I think it was over twenty three times in the season. She's done that six times now in ACC play mm-hmm. this year. I mean, the ball's coming into her and she's looking for her shot more. And uh, I don't know if it's just part of the polite nature. That's not like you know, a selfish player. It's not going to take their shot all the time, but they need that for this team to, to really you know reach its potential here in the postseason. Sometimes I think Hunter Couture is too unselfish. I see him make the extra pass and I'm like, no, you should have shot that. Because he's, right. he's right. the best yeah. shooter. Right, right, right. right. Um, was Eric Green the one, and forgive me, tech fans obviously i'm a little newer than everybody else on the set was he the one that uh despite tech not being the best as far as record goes one acc player of the year yes yeah. all right there we yeah. go yeah weren't they last place oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. that was yeah that was uh, yeah that was bad <laughs> that that rarely ever happens so much. yeah you yeah. have to be really really good yeah. um you know I, I think on the kitley thing like andy mentioned it last year i think last year she had the the pieces around her where taylor soul can a trailer could take over games you don't necessarily have that this year. I think you have good pieces around, but you don't necessarily have somebody outside of Georgia Amor that's going to take over a game. And I think you look back to specifically Amor, Amor wasn't, I mean, she scored the ball fine last year, but she didn't really kick it into another gear until March. It was the Kitley show, but it, it was a group effort. And this is more of, it's the Kitley and Amor show, and they're both going to shoot it 20 plus times a game. Kittley was 11 of 17 yesterday and had 34 points. That's pretty darn efficient. Uh, she also got to the free throw line a lot and she's been really good there. Um, you know, I think, like like Andy said, you, your original question was about what's it going to take for this team to go deep in March. I think the surrounding pieces are important. I actually asked um, on Saturday, spoke with Kelly Gramlich and I asked her about it um, from the AC Network and, and she said Matilda Eck, she thinks is the X factor because of what she provides with her length defensively, but also her three-point shooting. But if Kitley's playing like this, I think it comes down to Amor. And you saw yesterday, I think she finished with, what, 23 plus minus? She she is terrific. And she had, obviously, an injury early in the year. She had some ups and downs. But when she's on the floor, Virginia Tech is different. One man press break like Andy, one woman press break like Andy said. She is, she she controls the pace like no other. Um, she wriggle, like she has this uncanny ability to wriggle around people. And it's so fun to watch, but it's also so so tough for defenses to defend. And then she, she had that one shot, I think it was the end of the third quarter, where she like stepped back, shot goes up, and it like bounces around the rim and drops in. She just has this charisma, but also this ice in her veins. And you can tell the difference when she's not on the floor. Like, Tech wasn't a bad team, but it's a different team. In the second quarter yesterday, when she wasn't on the floor, I thought Carly Wenzel and Matilda Eck handled it okay, but there's just not that flow on either end. She can get out and go, and um, and she did that yesterday, and she makes, like Kitley, she makes a lot of things look really, really easy, and 
if those two players are 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 scoring, you know, over fifty plus points a game, it's that's going to be extremely tough to stop by every team going forward. And it's even more difficult because if you if you're a, a team, Geo, say you're you're North Carolina State, you're NC State, you're playing Virginia Tech. You probably you might have the talent to play Kitley one on one, but at the same time. I mean, she's probably going to go for like 35, right? She's gone for 34 two or three times this year. Okay, well, if you decide to double her, okay, you're going to leave somebody wide open, and this team is good enough to find that extra pass. Matilda Eck, like Kelly Gramlich told me, has been this unsung hero for this team in many ways offensively because she's terrific from three. Olivia Sumiel does all the dirty work inside and gets these rebounds. Claire, Claire Strack comes in and does the same. Carly Wenzel is an extra ball handler who's done a really, really good job of hitting clutch shots when needed. And all of that surrounds these two All-Americans that are two of the best players in the country. And um, it's it's really fun to watch. And honestly, I mean, Kelly Gramlich told me, and Carolyn Peck kind of said a similar thing. She was, you know, she obviously is on College Game Day, and we talked to her on Saturday too. The Final Four is is very achievable for Virginia Tech this year if it continues to play like this. And I think you've got a good glimpse of that. It's not necessarily this flashy thing, but when you take a team out of a game essentially in a first quarter, like it's not necessarily going to be flashy the rest of the way. I think that's the perfect spot to leave our women's basketball conversation. We've gone almost 40 minutes, and I feel like we could sit here and talk about it all day, uh, no doubt about it. Last thing I'll say about it, folks, is if you haven't, fully hopped on the bandwagon if you haven't followed along we can't encourage you enough to do so this is something that one has never happened before here at virginia tech two is something so unique there are schools that would kill to have a team to cling on to like this so enjoy the run while it's here um not all of these players are going to be back obviously there's a guarantee that you know kitley and king king are gone and so appreciate it watch it support it and uh and be along for the ride because it's definitely something special uh and Hopefully, and almost almost undoubtedly, there's going to be a, a couple more, at least one more home game come postseason time uh, inside Castle Coliseum because the Hokies almost guaranteed to be hosting uh, at this point, no doubt. Got to tell everybody that, uh, as always, Tech Sideline is presented by First Bank and Trust Company. And the boss man loves First Bank and Trust Company so much that he, he billed us for two ad reads on, on them today. So as our presenting sponsor, First Bank and Trust Company's support has been invaluable to TSL, helping us to bring all the great content across all of our platforms. Who you choose to bank with can make all the difference. Bank with First Bank and Trust Company. Visit firstbank.com to learn more. All right. Let's talk a little bit of uh, men's basketball here. Um, Andy, you were on the road up in Pittsburgh. Felt like it was Tech's last chance to have any kind of a run. It was a quad one opportunity on the road for the Hokies. Played decent in the first half. We're scoring, and then that fell off. 18-0 pit run blew it open. Uh, Yeah, it it turned ugly very quickly uh, in that game. and I was actually kind of surprised they were even tied at halftime. I thought Pitt played better. They were doing some stupid things with the ball. Allowed Tech to hang around. Uh, Tech was 50% from the field, I think, in that half. But they could not buy an outside shot. They just, and that was all day long. They were three for 20 from outside. That really caught up to them. Uh, Foul trouble caught up to them. Uh, Mike Young not exactly pleased with the officiating in that game. Uh, Made that pretty clear afterwards in in a funny way in the press conference. Um but I mean, you can't blame that on the officials. This is you got to learn how to play with fouls, and you've got to make some shots. They didn't do either uh, very well in that game. And you know, this is uh, just a team that doesn't quite have it this year. I mean, there's not going to be an NCAA bound team uh, barring some sort of miracle run in the ACC tournament. Uh, you would hope they could get a, an NIT bid here in the postseason and you know, have some sort of positive ending to the year, but. Uh, You know, they've been in a lot of these games. They've not figured out a way to close out a lot of these games, especially on the road. One and eight on the road now. Uh, It's just a a bad team in true road games this season. So 
Uh, just uh, all together, it's, it's just been a rough patch for this season. So bizarre. 12 and 2 at home inside Castle Coliseum, yet 1 and 8 on the road. You've almost won every home game uh, and then lost almost every road game. Not a recipe for, for great success. Sean Padula led the way for Tech. He had uh, his most points since he dropped 31 against Clemson, I believe it was. He had 26. Uh, he also had eight rebounds and seven assists. So it was kind of do it all if you're Padula uh, against Pitt. He had a great first half. What do you have? 14 points, six rebounds, and four assists at halftime. He was on triple double watch exactly. in that first half. Exactly. He got a third foul somewhat early in the second half, a little bit of time on the bench. With uh, two two minutes into the second half, Tech was winning 42-40. to 40. And within about a 30-second stretch to a minute stretch, Padula, Couture, and Barron all got in foul trouble. And, and two of those guys went to the bench. And I feel like I've been talking about lack of guard guards for uh, six weeks now. I guess I have been because that's, that's the main issue on this team. So when you're – your two starting your two starting caliber guards are in foul trouble and you've only got one wing that you ever really that you bring in off the bench and that's Tyler Nickel well now you have to play him at the 4 because Barron's in foul trouble so the only person you have to bring in off the bench is is Jaden Young and it's just the lack of guard depth is just killing this team um you know, MJ Collins has shown some versatility and in in that he can play on the wing and he can play the one. But at this point in his career, he shouldn't be playing starters minutes. But instead, he's out there playing 36 minutes, right? And you've got Padula sitting on the bench. who's While he's having one of the best games of the season, he's sitting on the bench with foul trouble. I thought it was pretty similar to when in the second quarter of the UNC women's game, when George Amor went out. And the offense just stopped moving. The ball stopped moving. They stopped getting good looks. And you saw that as soon as Padula sat down, um, things just stopped working on, on that end. And, and I think Tech has been a little quick at times this year when things aren't going well. They, they lose mental focus. Um, they did that non-conference play against FAU and Auburn. It's almost they – get, they get into a situation where they're like, well, we're not going to win, so we're not really mentally focused now. And they, I thought they did that against Pitt to a certain extent yesterday. But again, there's, there's just that lack of depth is not there. And you saw once, you know, Pitt ran off that 18 nothing run. Padula comes back in the game, and it was kind of even after that. Um, I know I sound like the, the UNC women's coach there, don't I? But, Take uh, out the 18 0 run. <laughs> yeah, they are it was right an in there. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, they would have won the game by three, right? Uh huh. Um, but uh, yeah, I just, I just think it, look, it's the same team that beat UVA by 34. We know this team has no margin for error. So when you have three starters get in foul trouble like that and you don't have enough guard depth and your only real guard depth actually has to play the power forward because you don't have any power forward depth either with Makai Longhurt, this team just has very limited options. I mean, I just remember when uh, you know Mike Young being here um, on the podcast before the season and I, and I said, Coach, it – it seems like you've got a little more versatility with your roster this year. You've got Nickel who can play the three or the four, which means you've got three three players, three or four players in this team who can play the four, and and you've got you know three guys who could play the five, and 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 you know you've got you know Rodney Rice was on the team then, so you had multiple guard options, and now you don't have Rodney Rice. Now you don't have Makai Long, and you know your options are very limited. So when you have three guys get into foul trouble like that, it's a completely different team. Like if, if, if a team came into Castle Coliseum with limited depth options, you know, off the bench and three of their five starters got in foul trouble early in the second half, I would expect Virginia Tech to run them off the court at that point. And that's what the Hokies, that's what happened to the Hokies on, on, on Saturday. And uh, it is what it is at this point. It's not going to change until the off season when you've just got to retool the roster. Right. Andy, what were your thoughts on, on the foul situation? Mike Young seemed a little fired up in the presser after. Well, the press conference was funny because he, he was asked about foul trouble and he was saying, you know, he shouldn't have to deal with foul trouble to his star players. Jeff Capel shouldn't have to deal with foul trouble to his star players and sort of, you know, indirectly talking about the officiating like that. And then a reporter who was there from, from Pittsburgh goes, are, are, you, are you saying that you thought the officials were too aggressive with the whistle in this game? And he goes, I didn't say that. You said that. <laughs> and then he paused for a second. He goes, you may be right. <laughs> and he got a, a good laugh. It's like, that man knows how to avoid a fine from the ACC for any kind of criticizing of the officials. Uh, uh, so, yeah, he was displeased 
with the officiating, to say the least. I, I would say uh, it was not a great officiated game on both sides in that game. I don't think it was like one side was definitely, I mean, Pitt had some issues of its own, some touch fouls uh, throughout the whole thing. Uh, it, it seemed like they were a little overzealous with the whistle in that game, but I mean, it, it affects Virginia Tech more because like Chris mentioned, the you know the depth problems that they have. And, and when your best players, I mean, your two leading scorers, Couture and, and Padula have to go down like that. It's tough, especially when nobody else is making shots. I think Nickel was over six in that yeah. game, over three or over four from outside. Um, you know, they didn't hit two threes until pretty late in the game, and they ended up three for twenty. So that tells you what they were up to that point. And uh, you're not going to win any basketball game if you're not making those kind of shots. Yeah, and I want to add this about officiating. Like, this was the first game this year where I thought, well, that wasn't very good officiating because. You know, Sean Padula, I think it was his third foul. You know, that was it was all ball. The replay showed it was all ball. And I don't think Connor Couture made contact on his fifth foul. But at the same time, like, we have the benefit of watching it in slow motion. Right. Will and I sat in the front row of the student section right under the basket for the UVA game. And one of the things I said to him during the game is like, man, I can't – tell what's a foul and what isn't it's so fast like those those bodies are moving so fast the ball is moving so fast the hands are moving so fast it is really really hard a lot of times to tell what what is a foul and, and what isn't it's, it's it's a lot different from watching it on tv it's a lot different when you're that close to having like as, as compared compared to like sitting in section 12 row Q or something like that. It's just a lot different when you're down there on the court. So they have a tough job. Ultimately, Virginia Tech has to fix their guard depth issues. Um, this is a game like even if Tech did have good guard depth, I mean, it's an 18-win pit team on the road. Like most teams are going to lose in, the, in that situation. It's, it's, so it's not like Tech's situation this year is because, oh, they lost a pit or they lost this game. No, the guard depth thing has bit them the whole year. In, in different ways, um, and this is just the latest. But I think we know where Mike Young will be focusing on in the transfer portal. Decon, any thoughts from you out of men's hoops before we uh, we get a little debate going here? Yeah, well, here's the thing. I think it's depth overall. Like, Makai Long not playing is big because when, like you said, Chris, Robbie Barron gets his third foul, you have nobody else to play there except for Tyler Nickel. You can play John Camden, but he has not played big-time minutes in many games this year. And then you look at the backcourt, like like, and we've hammered this point. But I think the bottom line is you're not going to win very many games if Hunter Couture is only playing like 26 minutes. Not obviously, Mike Young doesn't want him to play 40, but there there has to be a, a middle ground, and that means he's not on the court often enough. You know, we talked to Mike Young in the AC teleconference this morning, and you know he he was asked about just winning on the road in general, and he's like, you know, we've been in games. They were in this one for a while. They were leading at Florida State. They were leading at Miami. Like, they've been in games. But I think lack of depth and, like, they just kind of lose their composure in, in some moments. What, what was the quote that Champa Duel gave you? You mentioned it when we were uh, – About playing on the road. Just like, playing – for they can't play a full 40 minutes. Yeah, 40 minutes, and, and you need that on the road. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're playing in a hostile environment. Usually the other teams, you know, role players play better – at home in that situation, there's a smaller margin for error. And, you know, they have not rarely been able to put together just a full 40 minute effort like that on the road. And when you do that, you're one and eight when you're away from castle. And Tex one road win was against NC state when it turned the ball over 20 times. I, I don't think that was a road That's game. Tech should have won. That was not an opponent that played a full 40 minutes. No. <laughs> and, and so it's like, you know, it, this is an average team. And when you, when, when you can't put stuff together on the road, and you, but you, you're good at home, Gio, like you mentioned, makes it so you've got a pretty average record. Now they're seven and nine in the ACC. Um, you know, they run the table or do something crazy, right? But like, but at this point, they haven't shown enough consistency at all over the entire season. And I don't think there's anything you saw on Saturday when watching that game or listening to the game that makes you go, yeah, that's a team that deserves to play in March, just because. There are so many inconsistencies with this team. Sean Padula was great, but and I thought Malajo Batit was good too, but there have been games where a guy like Lynn Kidd is very, very quiet, and you need him. 
you need him, right? He was he and Poti were really good on Monday against Virginia, and then kids quiet again, and like again, just not enough consistency across the board. And I think it goes back to what Chris said, kind of just about the depth. Absolutely. All right. Well, they're going to be playing uh, tomorrow night. That is in this building right here against the uh, against the Syracuse Orange. So well, that, that had to do now, it, Gio. Had, had to do it. Yeah. Didn't I, you? Okay. The uh, so, listen, wireless. Sometimes dome? you got to yeah. poke the bear a little bit, right? It, the JM a wireless dome, which now has air conditioning. And when it was the carrier dome, it did not have air. This is these are yeah. true statements. Does it have functioning wireless though, just to keep up the weird tradition? <laughs> yeah, that, that was Syracuse actually like athletics. a big part of the name changes. They put in like these fancy things on the roof, and apparently it's supposed to have like the most stellar internet connection. We'll wow. test it that's out almost, for football. That's almost worth Our, going uh, for. You're not yeah. going. I'm not making the trip up. It's just so hard in the middle of the week. Uh, but shout out to our other interns, Kyle and Carter. They're up there. Um, kind of made that trip pit. Right, stayed up there. So uh, shout out to those guys for making that. But with baseball this weekend and Carter coming up was here yesterday. Yeah, he's an animal. He's he's ridiculous. So <laughs> Kyle said, "Forget you. I'm not doing that. I'll just see you up in Q's. Carter wanted to be a game day so bad that he did Pittsburgh, drove back, did game day, and then today he's on his way up to Syracuse. So he went five hours up to come back down to go. Almost 10 hours back up. I'm like, dude, only you, man. I mean, I'm going to Notre Dame on Thursday, and that's about 10, but. But would you do, you know, all of that? Well, back I, you know what? If this if this was a, a game, if Tech was playing good basketball, I would have uh, I would have considered going to Syracuse and then going to Notre Dame. Right, right. Um, which is not close to each other at all. But, no, probably but, 14 hours apart. But, yeah. Uh, you know, there's these things called airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're broke college kids. Yeah, we can't, yeah, we can't you know, be flying. <laughs> tell, tell, that, tell that to, uh, you can t- you can tell that to Will when Will, when I, when Will's like, hey, can can you drive instead of fly? <laughs> yep. It's it's you know when you got a comp- when you got a company car, it's much cheaper. But yeah. nice, yeah. Well, I I think Tech has it. To just touch on Syracuse just for a sec. Yes, Joe. sir. Please don't get me in trouble. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, like for for Tech, what can you expect for Tech fans? Adrian Autry, first year head coach. Mike Young said he plays about eighty percent man, twenty percent zone. Um, they had a they had what? It was Jim Beheim night over the weekend. Yeah. Look pretty neat. Um, they've got two really, really, really dynamic guards in Judah Mintz and, and J.J. Starling. Starling's a Notre Dame transfer. Um, and then they've got Malik Brown, who I think is playing at a very high level right now. So it's a it's a good team. Tech's going to have to – Tech's going to have to bring it. And I don't – I mean, I don't know if that's the, uh, the easiest place to get your second road win of the year. Syracuse uh, – Syracuse has no depth at the five due to do a lot of injuries. I think where Tech can win this game is feeding Kid and Poti, especially how well uh, they shoot it at the free throw line as well. Um, because I think uh, guard-wise, Syracuse known for recruiting lengthy guards. Besides Judah Mintz, he's a little on the smaller side. Starling, uh, Chris Bell, they're tall, they're long, they're like almost six seven, right? So uh, six five. Um, so that that I think if you're Tech, that's where you win the game is yeah. is Kid and Poti on the inside. I think uh, Autry has done a good job this year. Um, Tech fans will probably recognize his name because he's a former Virginia Tech assistant under Seth Greenberg. Um, his nickname, Red Autry, is, is his nickname. Um, I think when you when you take a program that for 30 or 40 years has been playing a 2-3 zone and you transition them to a man-to-man in one offseason and, you know, you've you've won 18 games with still – four games to go in the in the regular season you know that, that that's a good job but i know you have the transfer portal these days so you're bringing in guys who have played man defense elsewhere but not all of those guys are transfer portal guys obviously so there was an adjustment period syracuse is playing better basketball lately um certainly would not favor tech to win the game but at the same time it is a winnable game to a certain extent sometimes you're uh sometimes you win a game like that when maybe you least expect it like, I remember when, when Tech won in the Carrier Dome. I think it was in Mike Young's first season. It might have been. I was at that game. Yeah. That was the uh, Jalen Cohen game. Cone, yeah. yeah, and everybody was, was like, where game. in the world did that come from? Right? Yeah. Um, so it, it can happen. Um, but It was a the, Tuesday night at 9 p.m. I remember yeah. going. Love, yeah. love those 9 p.m. Yeah, I, I, so it's funny. So somebody asked Mike Young about just about, about you, you haven't won on the road, really. And how do you kind of turn the page? He's like, we just got to forget about it. Like we gotta go, like just gotta move past it, move on, and and that's something. Like again, I think this this team we we've seen this team play pretty well. You have it takes a good team to beat UVA by thirty four. I think we can all uh, agree on that. Um, but 
at the same time, we've seen Tech kind of fall flat in a lot of other areas. And Tech has not played, as Sean Padula told Andy after the game, a complete 40 minutes. You got to play complete 40 minutes when you go on the road. Tech hasn't done that. And that'll be the challenge on Tuesday. Then you got a big one on, on Saturday. Wake Forest comes to town after what just happened on Saturday. Nice transition, yes. David. Yeah, that is a beautiful transition right there. So we'll get right into it. Let's turn this into first take because I know uh, before we got we got a little heated. In Don't the other turn room. it into first take, please. <laughs> uh, we, 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 we were going to tee up the court storming conversation here. If you didn't see it, just go look it up because you can find it just about anywhere. I don't think we need to explain what took place, well, but do, we'll get our, get well, our thoughts on it. You should explain the teams. So it was Wake Forest, and it was the Duke Blue Devils, and Wake Forest picked up their first quad one win. They upset Duke on their home court uh, in Winston-Salem. They stormed the court. Kyle Filipowski got tied up in the, in the chaos in the middle of the floor, and he seemed to cross paths with a Demon Deacons fan. Uh, they they bumped or whatever, and now there is outrage. Should we get rid of court storming? The ACC, he, we will add, is the only... hurt. Sprained ankle is what they called it, officially. I mean, Shire said he didn't know if he was going to practice today. So he got hurt. So so we, we I that's, mean, we that, knew that, he that's, said... That's why. It was not the put... It was the, the fact that... Like, that's what the outrage was after the game, that, like, a player got hurt because of court storming. So... We're teeing up the conversation. Should we get rid of court storming? I think it would be a real big shame if we got rid of court storming. But we saw this happen to the best women's basketball player in the country, probably the best basketball player in the country, in Caitlin Clark, period. Um, and then Kyle Filipowski, um, the biggest brand in women's basketball, maybe not the biggest brand, but the biggest player brand. Sole person in, in women's basketball figure. Uh, and then Duke. And I think the fact that it happened to a Duke player and not, a Notre Dame player or any other team in the conference made it that much bigger of a deal. I'll let, I'll let I, you guys. You not? Oh, I thought you might call on one of us. Whoever wants it. Uh, uh, here, here's my opinion on it. Where was the Wake Forest security when, when Virginia Tech storms the court in Castle? Yes, there's a drop off from the student section. So it takes a little bit longer maybe to get to the floor. But I think that when Tech has stormed the court in recent memory, the security has done a good job of basically walling it off, kind of around the three-point line, close to half court, basically making a wall. So you, like, you're out on the floor, you run out, you make it so you control it, you let all the players and coaches kind of shake hands. Now, if there's somebody on the other end of the floor, they need to, you know, you got to, the security has to help them get out of the way. I think that's the biggest thing. Like people were calling for Philip out, like saying Philip he should have gotten out of the way. And it's like, he just finished a, a game. I don't like it's He was one of the guys that should be on the court, but I think the whole band court storming thing, you just have to control the narrative of it. And I don't think Wake Forest did a good enough job of that. I was there two times in January and security got on me about credentials. You know, you, you don't have the proper credentials to be down here talking to Virginia Tech's radio guys before the game, but they're nowhere to be found when it comes to preventing, you know, uh, keeping players and coaches safe after it. I think that's what it all comes down to. You have to make sure that like if you can balance it, and I think some schools have proven to do a good job of it where you let it happen but you also make sure the players and coaches are safe. I think one of the things with the Iowa thing is Caitlin Clark had to run across the floor to her tunnel to the locker room. And like her running, when well, she's crossing paths with all these students that are, are, are getting onto the floor, right? Um, you know, but if, but like I think it works in, in Blacksburg a little bit better because the students are on one end and the locker room's on the other end, and you can kind of just hold them off and, and let everybody filter off the court. So I think you just got to control the narrative better. Well, Jay Bayless mentioned this. I saw debates about this on ESPN. He's like, well, the schools love the visual of it. They like fundraise to it. They look at how, look at how much fun this is, this big win and all these people on the court. 
Uh, so they're not trying to stop it. Uh, they could probably control a little better in a Wake Forest that's just a really low seating, easy access to the court there. So they got to be smarter about, you know, funneling the students in a certain direction out of the floor so the players can get off the, the court. Uh, I would not want to ban it outright. It's kind of a cool little quirk in college basketball. You like to keep that kind of energy and that fun aspect to it. But they've got to be smarter about you know, getting the players off the, the court or having a plan about it. Uh, I will say this to players, like, don't fight across the stream of students. <laughs> like, don't run perpendicular to students coming you know, like a bat out of hell from the, the student section just out to the center court. Like, just let it happen and then work your way off the court. Like, Caleb Clark's running, like, across and gets sideswiped by a person. It's like, okay, just, you don't have to sprint off the court in that situation. Filipowski's, like, trying to go sideways across. It's like, just stand there for a second, let him come out there, and then, like, I'm not putting the blame on the players here. I'm just giving them some strategies on how to avoid situations like this. Like, you don't need to immediately run off the court in a in an odd direction where somebody's going to hit you from the side like that. Andy brought up a good point before. Like, let I appreciate the the lure of Duke basketball, one of the the greatest blue bloods in the history of the sport. Let's not forget that they just stormed the field when they they won a big football game to open up the season. Like th- this happens there too, right? And I think the reason this is elevated to this level is because Kyle Filipowski, one of the best players in the country, plays for the Duke Blue Devils. And I will just hammer home the point that this would have been a non-factor if a Georgia Tech player or Notre Dame or any other team in the conference for that matter, besides maybe Carolina and Duke, if this took place. It certainly uh, adds more of a focus to it, for sure. Um, I have two points. You should not use slow motion replay that you slow down to analyze every little inch movement of a player's body. You shouldn't use that to judge them on decisions they make in real time. Like, what direction am I going in? Did he put his arms out? Yeah, of course he put his arms out. There's two dozen people running at him in full speed. Of course, there's going to be a physical reaction. You don't even have time to think about it. It's just your natural human reaction. Um, I don't think he did anything wrong. Um, Second of all, I don't think your average person understands how competitive these players are. They don't make it this far unless they're highly competitive and, and they're They're pissed off after they lose in a game like that. And again, I don't think he did anything wrong. You shouldn't be anywhere near a player after a game. Uh, That applies to basketball to a certain extent, but especially to football. Connor Blumerick of Virginia Tech last year just ran over an ODU, or two two years ago, just ran over an ODU student on the field. Uh, I actually watched the replays and uh, and posted it on the boards uh, before the podcast. But he dipped the shoulder, intentionally went right into him and everything. You shouldn't storm, you know, you shouldn't be around football players immediately after a loss like that. Um, so when you do that as a student, I know, I know students don't think about stuff like that, but they're not thinking about the psyche of the, of the people that they're getting themselves around. Um, that, that's an, that's another, but like, you're never going to be able to stop it. Like you're talking about thousands of people and you've got a couple of dozen security guards. It's like, you can't control the mob, right? And what are you, what are you going to do? Tear gas them? back into the stands or something like that. I mean, it is what it is. You've just, but you got to find a way to slow it down and, and they have to also be smart about it too. Now I'll say this, man, I think court stormings are overdone. Wake Forest was unbeaten at home. They should have expected to win that game. You don't storm the court when you expect to win. But I can well, tell you, don't be the court story and police. Let it happen oh organically. Let them Duke have fun with that. Like, I disagree with the top 10 Duke team. And they like, had oh my gosh, it's not quad good one win yet. Sorry, yeah, Andy. I, I, I just mean like it doesn't have to be like this has to be the number one team in the country before you storm the court. Like sometimes you're not going to get that opportunity. So it's, yeah. I think the students just kind of want to have that opportunity at some point in their career to go do that. So you're not going to you know pass up a spot because you're sitting there going, well, they're ranked eighth in the country. And we're pretty good at home. So let's not do it this time, guys. Like this, this, <laughs> this there's no not nearly that much thought put into it. David would know his siblings. Who, who decides if the courts are court Dude, storming it's happens? Not, it's a like Chris said, it's a mob. <laughs> like, it's a, uh, you can't control the, you know, it's funny. When I was a student and I was on Castle Guard, there were one or two times when Tech played Duke, like the, the infamous Chris Clark game, Chris, where Chris Clark hits that shot and, and there are students behind us, where I'm in the front row, there are students behind us that are saying, if Tech wins, we're storming the court. We're, we're running past you, hopping, and we're going. Like, it's everybody for themselves. 
And I'm sitting here going, do I really want to storm the court? Like, that's a far drop. I, you know, like, like everybody has the mind of their own. Now, I just looked. There was still there was still time on the clock when the Wake Forest students ran on the floor. Like, that can't happen. You have to, you have to control the better. You have to, you, you have to make sure the, the opposing players and coaches are not affected by it. Now, it's not on, I wouldn't say it's not on Duke. Like, Duke shouldn't have to make sure Filipowski's on the floor. But if that happens here, if you're tech security, you got to go make sure he gets off the floor. Like, grab him before, grab him and help him off, surround him before tech students can get to him, right? Because you don't need that interaction. Well, if, like you said, there was still time on the clock when they started running on the court, how could you even get to him to secure him? And again, that's why... It all comes back to, to controlling the narrative. You you have to put player safety first. I think it all comes down to, to uh, the arena plays a huge factor. Like at Tech, you're not going to get this huge flood because the student section is right in front of a 10-foot wall. I, I think my senior year, somebody uh, broke their ankle ju- jumping over the, the railing after Tech beat Duke. So it's, it's, it is a lot more difficult, and you, it is a safety issue at Tech well, if you jump over that railing for sure. Well, if you're going to break your ankle, that's that's a good way to do it. Uh, really just, is it? <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you guys really fast, just just simple yes or no. Do you want it banned or do you want to keep it, Chris? Oh, no, no I, would no. I would never ban it. David. Keep it. No. Yeah, just You just got – it's, it's on the schools to take care of it. Fair enough. Andy. Yeah, keep it, but funnel it somehow. All right, sounds good. Let's do a round robin here uh, because a lot of other tech sports were in action this past weekend. We'll start off Virginia Tech women's lacrosse. Uh, we had Coach Skyra and Coach Ver- and uh, Olivia Vergano on earlier uh, before their season started. They had a big win on the road at Louisville. Uh, it was pretty cool. They played inside the football stadium, so that's always pretty cool when, when opportunities like that come about. And uh, they won it 14-10. to Olivia Vergano scored her 100th career goal. She's a junior uh so that was a big win for the women's lacrosse program happy for them softball pretty good weekend in athens for sure uh they beat up on radford and dartmouth and then they split one and one with georgia who's number three in the country and knocked them out of the ncaa tournament uh last week so when you can go one and one with a team like that that's huge last year what did i say last week last year yeah (laughs) Yeah. no I, i think um this this is a virginia tech team in terms of softball coming off uh uh, a weekend out in the desert in Arizona where uh, it dropped two games to NCAA tournament teams. And it's all about the non-conference in, 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 in a lot of sports, but specifically this. Pete DeMore historically has scheduled really tough teams. Tech has Alabama later this year. Um, the Hokies have had an opportunity against a Georgia team to, to make their mark. And that all com- that all comes back into play when it comes down to NCAA tournament seeding. And for Tech to walk into Athens, the second game, no, the first I can't I can't I think it was the first game of the weekend um, on Friday. But you beat Georgia. They beat they beat uh, Radford first on Friday. Oh, second and then game they, of the weekend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so same day though on Friday. Yeah, yeah. And then you know and they turned around and they lost to Georgia by a run on Saturday. But like. To play them close, this is the same team that beat you in the NCAA regional last year. Like, that is a big win, one that Tech will look back on later in the year because Georgia's a good team, and, and you need those kinds of wins to boost your resume when the when you know the postseason comes around. And I think you know, that's obviously Tech's biggest win of the year so far. But yeah, good good positive weekend. I mean, if the one loss you had was to a number three team on their home field, like that's a pretty good weekend. And I think they're starting to to find the rhythm. I think Corey McMillan had a huge weekend. Obviously yes. she was playing her former team in Radford, but um, you know, she was really good against Elon on Wednesday, comes back, has a terrific weekend. I think this Virginia Tech team starting to find its stride a little bit. Chris, I uh, wanted to bring up baseball here. Hokies ended up sweeping Rhode Island this past weekend. They bounced back a little bit after losing the Sunday game last weekend against Charlotte and then losing the midweek to JMU in, in a thriller where the comeback mm-hmm. falls just short. Come back, bounce back, you get this sweep. Solid pitching out of the freshman Renfro for the second week in a row. Faced a little bit of adversity. That was in the Friday game, first couple of innings. And you said it was it was really impressive to see the way he responded. Yeah, I think that's important for any pitcher, but p- particularly a guy making his second career start to understand, okay, yeah, you're going to get knocked around sometimes, but can you battle through it? Um, do you let it affect you and then things go downhill and you're out of the game 
after two and two thirds innings and, and all of a sudden your bullpen is overtaxed for the rest of the series, or can you rebound, stay the course and go a solid five innings, save the bullpen and give yourself a chance to turn the sweep, which Virginia tech eventually did. So, you know, he stayed in it and battled um, Tech's pitching was good all weekend. Uh, it didn't end the first weekend good, and it wasn't great, obviously, against JMU over the week. So the pitching depth thing is still a question, as it usually is at Virginia Tech. That's always the main question going into the season. But ultimately, they took care of business against Rhode Island, which they should have uh, greater challenges are ahead. The bats were uh, incredibly hot, David, for Tech baseball. They outscored the Rams 39-7 to this past week. Despite some chilly weather, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, yeah, Raza Umarani did a great job covering the, the whole weekend for us. Um, obviously, there was a lot of other stuff going on in Blacksbury at the same time. But, um, yeah, I think I think this to, – to come back and – obviously, that's a series you should win. But to come out and win it, like, to, to do it, it is big. It gives you some confidence moving forward. Um, tech is what, five and two? Five and two, yep. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I – think you continue to see strides from from the pitching staff, Parliament, Renfro, Stig. I thought he was good. He bounced back, right? He did not have a good good did Sunday not. in Charlotte, and he was excellent yesterday. Yeah, so I think seven strikeouts in uh, five scoreless. Yeah, um, you know, and speaking of strikeouts, I think Lindsey Grind had like ten uh, in in the Sunday games uh, for for softball. So. Um, this is a young pitching staff, one that did not have a single ACC start and still does not because we haven't started ACC play. To be able to get them reps at home, despite the weather, get a couple wins under your belt, everybody feels a lot better. But, like, you know, I think Tech is catching the ball well, like in terms of the, the catchers, like Henry Cook, Garrett Giebel, and uh, forgive me for McCann, David McCann. McCann yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, they're crushing the ball. They all um, have homers this year. Which is ridiculous. Like, a cat, you hear that, Chris? A, a, Tech has three three catchers, and all three of them have at least one homer. It's amazing. Freshman freshman has used line. three catchers yeah. so far. Well, yeah. McCann has not defensively caught. Okay. okay. So well, he DH. did. He did. He came in at the last couple of innings on Friday. Okay. Uh, he has not defensively started a game. It's been he just Cook on it, Friday, right? Ebel Saturday, Sunday. I'm a Braves fan, so I know what it's like to have multiple catchers who can yeah. just crush. But, so but, I think, valuable. but I think that's huge. Like, like, you're starting to see some of these young guys shine, and then what, Chris Canizero had a huge day, <laughs> day the other <laughs> day like ben watson on friday was yeah. a believe this uh, a single shy of the cycle and <laughs> yeah. really what, what he had two yeah. doubles a triple and a homer right yeah he, maybe that's kind of a sign of, of baseball in the modern era when you're a single away from the side yeah I, I have to double check i'm pretty sure it was it wasn't two doubles it was two homers and a triple and uh, a, a yeah, double i think yeah I think. but anyway he he, seven rbi he, he hit the ball pretty well and canizero was good and um i think what Michelle was good yesterday. I mean, they, yeah. they they got a lot of guys contributing and stepping up, and um, you know they got a long way to go, obviously. But it's it's good for for a lot of the young kids to get some reps under their belt, get some wins under the belt to to start the home campaign with a win. Uh, who do they have this week? Yeah, so coming up, come on out to uh, English Field, watch some Tech baseball, uh, especially if it's not too chilly. So they got a uh, a road one on Tuesday against Radford right down the street, and then after that, it's a ton of home games. Next weekend, uh, this upcoming weekend, I should say, Stony Brook, uh, that's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Then a midweek next week on the 6th, Wednesday, against Binghamton at English Field. And then the weekend after that, another home series. It's Notre Dame's in town, first ACC series. And then they got one more on next next Tuesday. So out of the next handful of games, I want to say it's like 12 home games to one road game on, on, on Wednesday. So, so uh, come to English. It's not going to be great weather on Friday, 47 high, 60% chance of rain. Saturday and Sunday, the chances of rain drops to 40%, but the high is 61 degrees both those days. That's as good a base baseball weather as you could possibly hope for this time of year. In yeah, Blacksburg. Blacksburg. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Meanwhile, it'll probably like snow in late March or something. I tell you what, speaking of the weather, the kids that came, there were a couple kids that camped out for college game day. Yep. Troopers. Yeah. It was like below I, I know, 30. I know one of them. So I saw Damien's picture uh, that he posted uh, within like five minutes of when he posted it on uh, 
for Saturday night, I guess. Yeah. So I'm Mike. So I texted one of them. I said, "Hey, you're on. Uh, you're famous now. You're, you're on yeah. Twitter camping out. Pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty crazy." Uh, uh, Geo, let me ask you a question. Yes, so sir. On, on Saturdays, when Wyatt Parliament starts, have you dropped a Parliament is in session after he closes an inning with a strikeout <laughs> or something like that? I have not. That that's not a bad idea. You got to come bring up with that a bunch of Parliament too. puns. Yeah, yeah. He, he was pretty good too. Both of his outings uh, thus far, he's been impressive. Um, don't sleep on Stony Brook. Stony Brook's pretty decent. Um, of a program Binghamton they should take care and then that Notre Dame series is going to be fun and then they play Marist which is John Chef's yes. former old spot yeah. so that that'll be that'll be pretty interesting there um wrestling tough one in Raleigh fell to NC State David, it seemed like the Hokies were going to run away with it, and then all of a sudden it flipped on its head. Yeah, Nick Brown and Jack Brizendine were down there covering covering it for TSL. Um, and they're up 12-3 through five matches, and you're thinking, oh, okay, they're in a really, really good spot. And then um, kind of just got away from them a little bit. It is, It was in Reynolds at NC State, but... Um, Place looked packed. Yeah, I think, I mean... Yeah, so Nick said sold out. Um, there, Reynolds Coliseum is it's, again a terrific, terrific venue for wrestling and for women's basketball. Yeah, but the women's hoops game I thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah, it was, but it was nice. I think just a, a little disappointing. Um, yeah, TJ Stewart had a huge upset win. Um, Makai Lewis did his usual thing. He finished the season without giving up a takedown. Um, but yet Tech, you know, had had five matches to go and proceeded to lose all five of them and. Um, I think that's a little frustrating, disappointing for a lot of tech fans when you know, tech wrestling is right there. You just need like to win like one more match, right? And you don't, and you end up losing out, and kind of just slips away from you. But Th- that one's my fault. Because Tech was up 12-3, to three and I texted Will, and I said, man, we're kind of steamrolling NC State. I think we're going to get this one. And then they didn't win a single match the rest of the I match. think Will tweeted, too, at some point yeah. when it was early and said, like, oh, Tech's steamrolling yeah. them right but now. They got the uh, ACC championship coming up soon. Yeah. So um, I believe oh, I believe break and then ACC championships are next weekend, the same time as the ACC women's basketball tournament in Greensboro. Awesome. Well, women's indoor track and field won their third consecutive ACC title. Men's track finished third, but they did beat UVA, so it's a Commonwealth clash point. So uh, that's something to keep an eye out for. Any final thoughts before we turn everyone loose? We went pretty long today. We've been good at keeping it to an hour. We're well over. Well, it's not every day that college game day comes to town. Very true. Yeah, I think just Tech women's basketball is in the national national, uh, spotlight now. Um, you knew it was going to happen when college game day came, but for tech to put on a show like that for the country to see Virginia tech as a women's basketball, I don't want to say as a women's basketball school, but, but to see the way Virginia tech supports women's basketball and that crowd was ridiculous. And the fact that the crowd was so crazy as it was for the game. Um, I, I took a cool video. I walked from. The one end of the line to the other. It was from Lane to the tennis courts by Haunt Hurst. Took me six minutes to walk the entire line. That was for the the Carolina game. Wow. After after game day, just terrific environment, terrific atmosphere. And um, I mentioned the power rankings earlier. Hokies are up in the AP poll. We'll get more bracketology news on Tuesday. But the ball's in their court, and and people are paying attention now. I'll take. Imagine that you win and. Um, you win and, and you get a little bit of love. So they're in a, they're in a really, really good spot. And I, you know, next week it'll be crazy because we'll be previewing the uh, ACC women's basketball tournament. No uh, doubt. I have one football note. And if you want to see something crazy, go on Twitter. And uh, I, uh, I retweeted it and or quote tweeted it. It's Kamari Copeland uh, back squatting. Mm. 635 pounds three times this past week. I wish he had done it before. The spotlight before the spotlight, so he could have been asked about it. They are legit parallel squats, and actually, I think he could have gotten a fourth rep, but he had a little bit of wasted motion in in his reps. There was some bouncing up and down, which which drained some energy. I'm I'm sure his coaches will work on that with him, but that just shows his incredible strength. Virginia Tech's back squat record is 700 pounds, set by William Boatwright back in back in the 80s. So, and Boatwright was like a big offensive lineman. He was bigger than Copeland. Uh, the fact that Copeland is 280 pounds and doing that is insane. And I think he also was one of those guys to break 20 miles an hour. That is This, yeah, this, this is a freaky athlete. Like, uh, like, I don't think people understand how highly thought of. Like, there's one, 
One of the recruiting publications ranks him as the number one JUCO defensive tackle in the country. Uh, and I think another one ranked him as like the number four overall JUCO prospect in the country. So this guy is considered a big time JUCO recruit and uh, is pretty incredible when it comes to his athleticism and his strength. 635, you do that at Anytime Fitness every day when we're over there, right? Uh, I've actually done it on the uh, the leg press, but not back squats. Not back squats. <laughs> when, you no look back that video, squats. when you look at the video of Copeland, the bar is like, like wobbly. Oh, it's like that's how much weight is on there. They're yeah, making this thing incredible. look like it's not even metal at that point. Yeah. It's nuts. That is crazy. What's coming up on uh, TSL uh, people can read? Yeah, uh, you, what are you writing? Gonna start the uh, eventually going to start against some <laughs> spring football previews. That uh, was, by the way, my brain not not connecting the words editorial content. And I said, "What can people read?" Uh, well, yeah, we'll have some uh, spring football. Uh, I think of going position by position, just kind of preview in the how, spring here. We got a couple of weeks coming up to the start of that March sixteenth. How did the poll turn out? Uh people were optimistic. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, you know, very optimistic view of the program. And uh, you would imagine that coming off the season like that. And I don't know if they're going to live up to those expectations, quite lofty expectations like that. But uh, yeah, people are feeling good about this program for the first time since I've been doing that poll for the last, you know, three times going back to my previous employer. Uh, lots of basketball stuff. I will uh, between Raza and Sam, and Sam Mostow and uh, Chip Grubb will have you covered on the uh, Diamond Sports front. Uh, I will be heading to Notre Dame on Wednesday, so I'll have plenty of basketball coverage for you. The women are have Notre Dame, and then they're at UVA, and then they start the AC tournament, which is crazy that, like, that's next week. It's nuts. Uh, the men have Wake Forest on Saturday after Syracuse on Tuesday, and then they're, they've got Notre Dame and Louisville, or Louisville and Notre Dame to close it out. I think Louisville and Notre Dame. Um but yeah, so we'll have you covered on the basketball front. I'm 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 excited to go to Notre Dame, and, and I think, you know, the fact that this team is is just playing as like it's fun to cover a team that's playing as well as it is right now. Um, so I'll have a bunch of basketball stuff. Chris, what are you writing this week? I am uh, going to write an article tomorrow on uh, women's basketball, and I'm going to compare like the future expectations to the program, like like Kenny Brooks, like he'll be judged on a different set of criteria. After, you know, Kitley, after going to the Final Four, after hosting college game day, it's like Frank Beamer was judged on a different set of criteria after 1999. Um, I would say even Mike Young is judged on a different set of criteria after winning an ACC title and, and obviously going to a Sweet 16 under Buzz. So how, how what are going to be the expectations of the women's program f- by certain members of the fan base and donor base after this season? Um, uh, it's It's something that... I didn't really think about it for the men's program until until this year when I've seen some of the anger uh, of them not being quite as good this year. Um, obviously, we saw in, you know, Tech almost won the national title in 99, and then they had the 10-win streak. But, you know, in some of those 10-win seasons, it was almost like we were as focused on the things the program the, – the very few things the program was doing wrong, we were more focused on those things sometimes when we were – actually win in 10 or 11 games, right? Um, so I kind of want to warn people also about, okay, let, let's maybe not quite do the same thing to the women's program as we did to the football program and and the, uh, the men's program to a certain extent. Awesome. Well, that's a perfect spot to leave it. Thanks so much for joining us. It was a fun one for episode 350 of the Tech Sideline podcast. For Nick Brown, producing behind the scenes. For Chris Coleman, David Cunningham, Andy Bitter, I'm Giovanni Heater. Saying so long. Enjoy the festivities this upcoming week with everything Tech Athletics. We'll see you next time.